Welcome to Hopscotch, Latin American Literature in Translation. And today I am delighted to have with me my old friend, uh, Gareth Williams, who is um, who teaches at the University of Michigan and is the author of a number of books, including this one, The Other Side of the Popular, um, a book called The Mexican Exception, and uh, most recently, uh, this book, uh, Infrapolitical Passages. And uh, today, we're going to talk about this book, Juan Rufo's uh, Pedro Palomo, um, a novel of Mexico, as the translated subtitle has it. So, Gareth, thanks so much uh, for doing this and for taking the time. And I, my first question, very open, uh, how would you suggest approaching this book? Thanks, John. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks for uh, bringing, in, bring, bringing me in to talk about Pedro Paramo, which thinking about it is perhaps uh, the book that I've read most in my life. Wow. <laughs> most. And that, so that might be the key to kind of... Uh, to how to engage, how to get into the book, uh, I would say uh, repeatedly, over and over again, obsessively. I think I was about uh, 20, 21, the first time I, uh, I read the book in, in undergraduate in, in the UK. And there was something about the book that really kind of confused me terribly, but at the same time grabbed me. Uh, and so at that point, I, familiar, I decided that I needed to familiarise myself with the criticism uh, about the book. And then from there, I, I don't know how many times I've read it. I mean, I've taught it obsessively for like 25 years. So if I said that I'd read the book 40 times, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of insane because it's it's a book that teaching it, I always felt I could never wing it. So I'd have to reread it all over and over again, right? And so uh, until it got to the point in about 2017 when I decided that I was going to abandon it and wasn't going to do it anymore. I just had you know. But I would say that for me, at least, one thing that strikes me about this novel is that, um, as we were saying before we started, John, that it's, it comes from nowhere within the tradition of there's nothing. In, the, 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 my impression, at least, is that there's nothing in uh, prior to the publication of this book, there's nothing in the Mexican tradition that would indicate that this book would make sense. In other words, I, I would highlight that, that this is a novel that is historically singular. Uh, in the way it addresses, in the way it thinks, and the way it, it thinks about history, and the way it thinks about power and domination. Um, and, you know, there have been co comparisons with uh, the work of Nelly Campovello from beforehand, you know, such as Cartuccio, La, Las Manos de Mamá. And I think that that comparison works, but only partially, because I think that the, we still have to recognise that Pedro Paramo is is in a completely different place. I mean, Campo Bello is great, but this is in a completely different place. And I think it's in a completely different place because of the, uh, the, like the, the this perspective that it, it insists upon. Right? It's it's a there are many novels. Uh, written about marginalization or about poverty um uh, but this is a this is a novel in which it relays the entire experience of uh the sense of abandonment and of domination and of expropriation now it's this experiential uh question of uh, a life of the theft of life right and it goes back to uh, Proudhon's uh, um, adage, you know, from the 19th century that, you know, property is theft. This whole novel is, a, is essentially that, right? Property is theft. And, and life itself is is stolen. And so for, for me, you know, you've got this, 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 the experience, this collective experience of a town is kind of suspended between two orders, neither of which can really take over. Uh, and I think that that's very very powerful. Um, you have the the, the feudal Catholic uh, sacred order, which is completely immersed in the injustice, obviously, with with a figure such as Renteria. And then you have this uh, the, this modern economy of uh, the the, the uh, an incipient capitalism, which is emerging, which is based on uh, displacement of of uh, peasant life. Uh, and as I mentioned before, land theft. So it's it's a whole question of, of paradise lost, 
over and over again repeatedly, right? And that's and that's the the quest of the of the novelist is to find some kind of paradise, you know, that the the opening mm-hmm. the opening passage of the is this this amazing image of the the narrator trying to separate his hands from his mo- his mother's dead fingers, and that that separation then is the beginning of a quest that's already impossible um, and that will will fail uh, inevitably. So there's so much here in, in what you just said. I, I want to start with the first thing you said about, well, first of all, your obsessive rereading and at the same time it being singular. And in some ways that's mirrored or anticipated perhaps in the text itself because on the one hand, it is a repetition. Like it's a return, like you say, it's a sort of quest for, for, for paradise, um, uh, going back to something. On the other hand, it's the first time that the, the at least what, the person who seems to be the protagonist at the beginning Juan Preciado, he, he gets this place, this village, Comala. So it's both the the first, it's singular. He hasn't been here before. He has to be guided there. And at the uh, on, the, on the other hand, he's repeating this injunction from his mother to go back, to look for his father, to return to this place. But the place is not what it was. And, and there's that sort of disencounter, right? Missed encounter between what it was and what it is. So I, I wonder if you could talk about those, yeah, obsession, perhaps, not just your obsession for the book, but obsession within the book and repetition and singularity within the book as well. I think one of the main things that strikes me is the movement of uh, of the book. You know, the, we could say that the first half of the book is is this movement forward, this uh, a kind of advance, almost like a, a quest for some kind of progress or development in in the novel itself, which then leads inevitably to to the grave. Uh, and it's only when the narrator becomes Juan Preciado, you know, become, becomes uh, a figure with with a name, a surname, and uh, an entire history there. It's only at that point that that moving forward is curtailed, and we begin to understand the, pr- the prior history of the entire story of, of, of Comala, but also story of, of, of Mexico. Right, and so there's this there's this sense in the novel in which every move forward, every every final, every understanding is already too late, uh, and it's only when you get to the already too late that any kind of understanding can 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 emerge, and so it's this, um, you know, I, I think that the the criticism the criticism of the novel calls it, you know, the the the, the circular temporality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it's play it's playing with with this. Constant tension, though, know, between uh, mythical town versus the time of, of progress and development, uh, or of a, a, a Mexican modernity that is essentially uh, colonial and feudal, and uh, such and such. No, so there's there's this sense of of um, when we when we talk about the multi temporality of the of of the novel, you know, we've got. Uh, so many different kind of hate, so many kind of different moving parts that you can never get a handle on on uh, on the movements that that, that 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 everything seems so arbitrary. I don't. Even, I'm going into something here that I don't even know what I'm talking about, John. You know. <laughs> but I mean, that's one thing. One thing. One thing. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. But one thing that I do think is interesting is that that, that maybe if I think about it in terms of different kinds of calendar. In, in the in the novel, right? Mm-hmm. So you you got the calendar of modern uh, uh, capitalist theft. You have the calendar of of uh, the Christian obligation. The only concrete date I think in the entire novel is December eighth. Um, which I think it's when when the fiesta the pop the, the fiesta popular mm-hmm. takes so, over. You know, the, the, the the feast of the immaculate conception so you've got these overlapping calendars and then of course you've got the figures of uh dorothea and donis who are living in this kind of perennial uh sin kind of this mythical biblical time as well so you have all of these different calendars kind of superimposing one on the other and of course how to begin to grapple with that experience uh when all of that leads to exploitation and misery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so that it's that that's one thing that I find amazing about this particular work. I, I love you. I love that idea that uh, in this novel, 
every understanding is already too late, right? So, so it's about so trying to catch up, but you, but yeah. quite being able to catch up with these processes. I, I, okay, I've got a question. Maybe it's a little bit out of left field. Maybe it isn't. Um, is Kamala Mexico? I mean, to what extent is you know? Th there's a whole discussion about the ideas of national allegory, which you're very familiar with, of course. A, a guy yeah. called Jameson. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of resist that personally, um, yeah. but on the other hand. Uh, this book some, seems, in some ways, to insist on that. So, I, I don't, how would you take the notion? It's Kamala, Mexico. Well, I think that inevitably, well, it's 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 Mexico, but with a with a vision that's uh, that um, moves beyond the paradigms of national identity. I think that the you know there are moments in which the linguistic turns of the of the characters are. are you know, very regional, regionally identified, nationally identified, but it's a story of uh, of uh, of rural impoverishment, right, and of, uh, historical injustice, and in that sense, it speaks to Ireland or Scotland. You know, I was reading it in Liverpool in probably 1984, 85, and there's something there about this history of of expropriation and and, and immiseration, kind of systemic immiseration that is most certainly uh, Mexican, but it's also uh, capitalism itself, right, in all of its forms. And you talked about the notion um, that it's about the theft of life, property is theft, and and, and life being stolen. On the other hand, it, it strikes me at the same time. That, I mean, this is a book about the afterlife, right? It's about what remains after uh, life. So it's it's not exactly about death either. In some ways, Kamala is dead, but not, in other ways, well, it's haunted, right? I mean, that's another way. I mean, this is a ghost story in in, in some ways. So it, it's neither fully alive, nor on the other hand, is it is it fully dead? I, I wonder if you could, um, if you have any thoughts on on that. Yeah, I think it's the sense where you, you know you don't get over the past. Uh, you know, we live in we live in societies which are obsessed with something called closure, and what we see, uh, you know, uh, if there's any kind of trauma, then immediately the uh, uh, the the media start talking about closure. And what we see in a novel like this is that uh, that is an ideological fantasy, right? That there's such thing as as closure of the of the past. And I think that a figure such as Susana San Juan is almost like the embodiment of that idea of being haunted and of and of surviving. It's 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 a, it's a novel of survival, isn't it? Susana San Juan, who, who's the only character who's actually had a life beyond Comala, uh, has this kind of passive resistance to uh, to the two main father figures in 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 to the entire kind of patriarchal order of of Comala. So we, we were talking about the way in which. This book is, uh, uh, among other things, about sort of the limits and transitions between uh, life and death. And, and you were talking about Susana San Juan, the figure of Susana San Juan, and and, and what how she functions within the novel. And I want to add, you you know, I think that one of my little catchphrases is something always escapes. Yeah. I, and uh, I, I wonder if Susana San Juan, well, she escapes Pedro Paramo. Would you? Is that fair? But or, or, but tell me your take also on Susana San Juan. Does Susana San Juan escape? I think the answer there for me would be yes and no. Um, uh, obviously, she's absolutely subordinated to the to the entire order of, of uh, Pedro Paramo, but at the same time, she, for me, it's like the question for, for Susana San Juan is, does she represent a kind of a romantic alternative or, or not? And the answer there is... Uh, for me at least, in this world of absolute disillusionment, in this world in which there's no such thing as utopia, the idea of an escape, uh, or at least of a romantic outside to the world of Komala, is difficult to sustain. Now, th there are those moments in Susana San Juan where we see echoes of a past. You know, uh, you know the, this image of uh, sensuality and a relationship to, to uh, 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 happiness in a, in a life beforehand. Um, so, but again, it's that sense in which if there is escape, when it comes, it's already too late anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's already that that is already passed. And so, I think that uh, Susana San Juan is 
interesting is important because I was, as I was saying before, you know, she does undermine the patriarchal order of both the Christian order in, in Comala when she says to Renteria, go away, leave me alone. I'm not interested in your salvation. And also uh, in which her subordination to Pedro Paramo uh, is not actually subordination, right? It's uh, it's something else. It's uh, it's something that cannot be. It doesn't have a it doesn't have a language in the novel itself, and yet it's also the thing that unworks the order of of Pedro Paramo's domination. So there's something very mysterious there in Susana San Juan that I think is very interesting. So does she escape? There's something there. <laughs> I, I, we, don't necessarily, we don't necessarily have a vocabulary to understand what it is, I think. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, it's obviously, no, it's not a romantic escape. But on the other hand, I suppose you were talking earlier about the what this book has to say about property and expropriation and, and theft. On, on the other hand, the possession is also an illusion right so that, that, that yeah. i mean that that's that's pedro Paramo's dream yeah. or one of his dreams is to possess san, san juan and he never can and obviously she's sacrificed in some ways you know that's the typical uh notion of of women uh, you know she goes mad and so on and so forth right so it's it's not a sort of romantic escape but she escapes she she she, she can't be possessed by um yeah. Yeah. By, by pedro Paramo at least Yeah, and there's something, and the whole town is fascinated by her as well, isn't it? Because the you know the the women of Comala are very kind of aware of Susana San Juan. There's something going on there with Susana San Juan that the you know the chorus mm -hmm. like to know what that's about, and and so there's a my mysterious quality to her that they 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 the town is very aware of her non place in their in their life, you know. So I think that's very interesting. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no. In fact, can you say more about this sort of chorus? Because it also strikes me that this is a this is a book in part about gossip and rumor, right? There's all this, there's all these people on the edges and the fr many different kinds of edge, many kinds of fringe, who right. are seeing and watching the sort of spectacular display of power, but also the way what goes wrong, like when the son, for instance, and the horse um, uh, es es escape, I suppose, uh, uh, again, yeah. and yeah. so there's all this. Yeah, chit chat, right? Even again, even beyond the grave. I wonder if you could yeah. talk about that notion of it, maybe it's got something to do with that notion of language as well and 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 forms of communication. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that the um, you know the, the novel opens with the figure of Abundi, you know, which is this figure of of, uh, of communication who brings together, sews together both the beginning and the end of of the novel, right? I think that uh, Abundi is an interesting figure. In terms of the uh, the gossip of the town, you know, there, there's, there's the, it's the frailty of of uh, of the power of the order of Comala that's very interesting, uh, and I think that the, the the gossip and the rumor is all speaking to uh, that frailty of power that we see when Pedro Paramo folds his arms and declares uh, that he's going to kill them all, he's going to leave them all to die. Of course, by doing that, he's also bringing his own economy to its knees and bringing around his own death. No, and it's not clear to what extent he understands that. Um, but it's that, right? It's the it's the frailty of power. And if there's a frailty of power, then it means that it can be transformed. And I think that in the wake of that, all of the 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 rumors of the people. Uh, a, a figure such as Edovikis, for example, no, who's this kind of museum curator of the memories of everybody who's left, you know, mm -hmm. who've just left all of their kativatis in their house, and it, and it's that these it's it's the, this collective language that's constantly circulating around the things that have been left behind, um, but at the same time can be rekindled in the name of something slightly different, something that's not this, not. Pedro Paramo, and I think that that's something that um, the novel kind of points towards. But again, it's another one of those mysteries that it does not; it refrains from trying to resolve. And I think that 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 speaks far clearer to the idea of the ambiguity of experience than it does to kind of any kind of manifesto or something like that. You know?
So we're, we're coming towards the end uh, of our time, but I, just to pick up on what you were just saying as well, what the novel points towards, you started off by saying this is a, a singular novel, this comes from nowhere, there's nothing in the Mexican tradition that in some ways explains this. I wonder if you could talk about the aftermath or the legacy of, of Pedro Paramo itself and perhaps confront the question of magical realism I mean, famously, Gabriel Garcia Marquez says he read and reread uh, Pedro Paramo and that without Rufo, there wouldn't have been Cien Años, 100 Years of Solitude and so on. So, um, yeah, I wonder if you could talk about the what, what the aftermath and what, and what Pedro Paramo points towards in, in what comes next in Mexican or Latin American literature. Well, Garcia Marquez basically lifted the first, the opening sentence of uh, of a hundred years of solitude, lifted it from Pedro Paramo. Uh, the, you know, um, so the influence is very much there. For me, um, this is also a novel that that kind of uh, remains on the margins of of the boom. The boom was a bas- was a Barcelona phenomenon. Uh, it was a, a an editorial phenomenon based in in in. Uh, in Catalonia, and Rufo never formed part of that. Obviously, he was remained in Mexico. Uh, and in terms of uh, its influence, I think its influence has been uh, enormous. Right, we could think of you know uh, novelists who came were working slightly later. You know, I'm not I'm not sure if there would be uh, Rosario Castellanos or uh, I don't know Elena Garro. Uh, without Rufo. Uh, I'm not sure if there w- there'd be, you know, even contemporary Mexican writers, you know, I read um, uh, Emiliano Monge and there's like resonances of Rufo. It's just, there's there's a, um, a sensibility there that's, that's uh, that for me at least is, is Rufo. Um, another young writer that I'm very interested in is uh, Eduardo Ruiz Sosa, who uh, lives in Spain at the moment, but there are moments uh, in his writing which, in, which echo the concerns that we see in, in Pedro Paramo. Fernando Melchor, no? Fernando Melchor is, is, is somebody who's, for me at least, is, is also kind of along the same line. So I think that the, the influence there is, is tremendous, tremendous. Um, whether we sustain the idea of the boom or not, I think that the I think that the the, lit, the literary the literariness of the of the novel itself uh, is more than enough uh, to to for, for it to have a, its own after afterlife. Without the without the idea of it belonging to a boom aesthetic, you know, I think that it's something that's uh, came out of nowhere and has really kind of created the conditions for a whole uh, series of writings from generation to generation. I think that that's the power of, of this, this particular novel. That's the originality, the singularity of it. And, and just as the last question, or, uh, although it starts as a comment, I think, so in, in some ways, the book, I think, is often seen as a precursor. Right, so uh, maybe the success of of Garcia Marquez, and then then these other authors who you're talking about. I also think about Cristina Rivera Garza, yeah, t- yeah. T- t- talking about Rufo and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, so so Paramos uh, often claimed as a as a precursor, right? Like, without him, these other things uh, wouldn't have happened. But it still strikes me that it is worth returning to Pedro Paramo, and I think it strikes you that you, again you started with this notion of endlessly returning to Paramo. Sure. That uh, you know, it hasn't been exhausted by at all by the boom, right? And in some ways, it, it still stands up in a way that not everything that was written in the following ten years necessarily stands up. You know, it still yeah. attracts us and draws us. Would it, I, th- I think you do. Absolutely, I would agree. Absolutely, because deep down, uh, what this particular novel still does is it connect it connects us to the experience the classical experience and tragedy and not every novel can do that that's that's the one thing that really hooked me at least with with uh pedro paramo was this sense of uh human experience coming out of uh the intuition of tragedy and i think that the, there are very few writers who actually uh do that 
well. For me, for me, it was it, it was Rufo and also Arguedas, the two who who. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's just a sensibility there that I that I couldn't let go, you know. And so I think that that's that's the thing for me is that you you know um, we don't need the boom when you have this kind of this tragic consciousness, and that's what literature is for me or should be. Then, um, and I think there's somebody like Roberto Bolaño is all is all, you know is always there along that in that space, right? And you mentioned Rivera Gaffa as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, so that's the thing for me, tragedy. Well, that is a perfect place at which to end. Uh, thank you so much, Gareth, for your time and generosity of expertise. This has been great. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Take care of yourself. Good to see you.